Alright guys, we're trying this review with uh, gameplay included in this one, so this is fairly new to me, but we'll see what we can come up with. Uh, I did miss the recordings for the beginning of this game, unfortunately, uh, that was just due to Twitch running out of uh, its own time to save the broadcast by the time I got around to actually downloading it. So, we're starting from here. Okay. And with this review, we are also going to uh, be mentioning things about Assassin's Creed Rogue, because if you guys have seen my last review, I mentioned how I'm starting from uh, that series there and working my way up uh, through the story chronologically as best I can. What I noticed immediately with this entry in the Assassin's Creed uh, franchise is that just... Uh, Graphic-wise, this is loads different than Assassin's Creed Rogue, and I believe they came roughly in the same year, if not two years apart. Obviously, what you can tell is that this one is far better than the other game and the games previous to it when it comes to the graphical look. You can see, I mean, just if you played Assassin's Creed Rogue and this one right after, they feel like... Well, obviously they're entirely different games, but they feel like they're made by entirely different companies. So, what you could obviously tell as well is that uh, they must have used a new engine by this point. Uh, it feels far more fluid, you move better, you can descend faster, you have a lot more customization options, options when it comes to actual headpieces, uh, gauntlets, your torso, your pants. Uh, your weapons. If you can see on my back right now, I have actually a two-handed heavy weapon, so if you're like wanting to be that kind of bruiser type, obviously this is what you'd use. You also have your classic one-handed weapon uh, and your... and almost like a pole, actually. So with your pole, you will have a lot more range, you parry. It's just... the, the great thing about observing your fighting style is that they do feel different. The heavy weapon feels heavy. The one-handed weapon feels fast. The pole, it feels almost like unorthodox in a way. It feels a lot more monk-like, I suppose would be the word I would use there. I had almost forgotten to mention as well that you actually have the option of having lethal weapons and non-lethal weapons. So with that pole-like weapon, you can use something that's like a, a mace, similar to that anyway. I know it's called something else. Um, and uh, the way you fight, it's more uh, blunt as opposed to, you know, stabbing and piercing. And I noticed that difference immediately when I had first started out the non-lethal route with a pole and then moved on to a lethal route. And everything felt more precise when you're working with lethality. Um, when it came to non-lethal, it felt just like, you know, like a wild man swinging his weapon, I suppose, like baseball bat style, almost. Uh, and I imagine the same was similar with the one-handed weapon, though admittedly I hadn't tried the uh, non-lethal route. Uh, with uh, To add on to that as well, I did forget to mention that there are we uh, different weapons you can use with uh, your firearms. So you can actually use a, um, a rifle-like weapon, and with that weapon... You, it's, it's weird that they label it non-lethal, but obviously you can shoot down your enemies, and shooting an enemy is lethal. So your non-lethality comes down to your uh, melee approach to a situation, which is surprisingly pretty entertaining, actually. So when I was just trying out different weapons and I went the rifle way, I realized just how... Customs agents of France uh, can I, I guess it's just entertaining. It is. It's they were pretty creative with the way they uh, use these weapons. Uh, the next one coming up was a guillotine a that I wanted to mention, and with What's that guillotine, you actually have a almost a hybrid between a a mortar and a heavy weapon. And this will come up in the later part when I show the, the DLC, so you will see it. Um, and it handles just like a heavy weapon, but obviously you can shoot down groups of enemies with your mortar. And I believe you have like three, uh, I guess, shells is what you'd call it. Uh, I'm not exactly sure. But bringing Monsieur de killer to justice the handgun is pretty interesting as well because yeah, you obviously have the 
classic single shot, reload, single shot, reload. But there's also a almost a shotgun-like thing where the, there's like three different barrels and they spread. So you have a spread shot. Um, and obviously there are better weapons in that same, in a similar form. There's also one particular weapon where you could actually, it's almost like you have a clip, but it has multiple barrels within it and it's a single shot. So... Instead of like single shot reload, it's more like one shot, two shot, three shot, four shot, five shot, then reload. The review might look a little choppy, so I do apologize in advance for whatever the flow becomes. I still haven't quite figured out how exactly I want to do these uh, reviews slash commentaries, but uh, what I'm going to try my best to do is when I get real talky, I'm going to try to do that over the gameplay moments, like such as now, rather than speaking while they're... Um, uh, doing a cutscene because I do think that a lot of the cutscenes are important in establishing the characterization of uh, the people that exist in this world so you can kind of see their motives why they're doing the things they do um, and how it leads to the decisions they make later on in the game with that being said I'm gonna get right back to uh, how the game handles itself so when I was mentioning free running earlier uh, for the most part, your character does go where you intend to make him go, but you do run into these weird, like, blip-like feelings where you you can see a ledge that you can make it to, and you could jump to it because you've seen your character jump even further than that, yet he doesn't want to make that leap for whatever reason. Um, so, obviously, that's still an ongoing issue that was in the previous game. It's just not nearly as bad now as it was before. Uh, and of course, I'm saying this, I haven't played any of the games that are chrono chronologically beyond this point, so I'm speaking purely from the perspective of Assassin's Creed Unity. This game does handle itself similar to uh, an RPG, so I guess we'll just uh, refer to it as like an RPG light, so to speak. So of course, because of the customization, but you can also upgrade your skill points. So. Some of them were, are a good idea, some of them it's like, what were the creators thinking? Because like, Double Assassination, or, uh, hmm, I don't want to say lockpicking, though, it, it, that's a very useful skill to have, and I could see why they would want you to work towards that goal. But, like I say, Double Assassination, or a heavy attack, uh, it just seems really odd that they would kind of almost create this block in between the player and the game. Uh, and the only way to release that block is to progress further in the story. I do want to uh, address that assassination and how new that is, but what I want to refer to right now, uh, before I forget, is that uh, there is multiplayer in this game, and the game does encourage you to play that. Um, I was pretty entertained. Uh, I might include some gameplay in this review, or maybe possibly another video between me and my cousins. So if you ever saw my Castle Crusher series, it is with those cousins. Uh, we had a lot of fun. Uh, there were some moments, though, where it felt like if you have three players, it almost wants to like break the game. Like It doesn't know how to process it. Just weird things happen, and... Um, you end up with frame rate issues or stuttering errors, and it just ends up being kind of uh, a killjoy. This is a pretty awesome sequence, and uh, th again, this is another thing I want to address as soon as I get through the rest of what I'm trying to get through. So, uh, when we're referring to multiplayer, when it's uh, just you or uh, you and one other person, the game does seem to be pretty stable and can handle what you're trying to do from there. So it just seems to be a, a three and up problem. So like I was saying earlier, what a great sequence. Like this completely took me by surprise. I was not expecting anything like this before. Uh, from the previous games that were released, I cannot recall a situation that was similar to this. Um, so this was a pleasant surprise. Uh, and I believe this is called a Helix Rift. And let me show you just how bizarre it could get in these and why I just love the hell out of them. I can't. There you are. And you found the exit. Good. It's an unsafe. 
stable vortex of energy, so there's no telling how it will... I don't want to spoil it too much for you, but the other two are pretty great as well. Um, and obviously take place in different time periods. So, back to um, <clears throat> assassinations and how they occur now. So, from what I can recall from the previous entries, was that as soon as you would assassinate uh, your target, they would then have almost like a monologue, which, you know, was always fun. But now it seems that after you assassinate your target, you experience their memories, or I, I'm not sure if this is like new lore. I mean, obviously it has to be, but it's just a way different approach to what they used to do. And I'm not sure if I like it more, if I don't, I, I don't know. But uh, I don't know, you let tell me. Let me know in the comment. So now we're gonna bring it around back at Blink. I think I said enough about gameplay, uh, but what I really want to talk about is the story and uh, maybe touch a little bit on the lore here. So this scene that's coming up has a really interesting character, I think his name's uh, Marquis de Sade. Uh, I love these types of characters in any sort of game they're in or any type of setting because you know they're almost like a Machiavellian type of uh, intelligent person that's that like is a little disturbing and kind of uh, they seem like they float like I don't even know like they're like an in-between type of person if that makes any sense Le Roi des Tunes Lieutenant Latouche of Paris give more money to crippled beggars than whole ones. Le Roi des Tunes sees in that bit of trivia an opportunity to motivate his less successful employees. That man has lost a foot. Now you can charge in there, cause a great disturbance, and send all the rats scurrying back to their holes. Or you can disappear into the swarm and follow the rats back to their king. Either way, that man has lost a foot. It's done. Take him to the clinic for a proper cauterization, then send him back to the street. Come on, up you get. I appreciate the advice. Not yet. Who are you, precisely? And why help me? <laughs> oh, I've had my eye on you for some time now. I feel it my sovereign duty to aid all those who suffered in cruelest bondage with me at the Bastille. And I have a vested interest in seeing the King of Rats caught in a trap. As to my name, I have the pleasure of being Donatien Alphonse Francois, Marquis de Sade. Do pay me a visit when you've tired of chasing vermin. Oh, he's left a lovely trail. <laughs> so, that is such an interesting character. Like, whoever wrote him was on it. Whoever acted for him was on it. It reminds me a lot of uh, Arden in Final Fantasy uh, 15, I believe it was. Uh, I would not be surprised if it's the same voice actor, actually, because I could see a lot of similarities between the two characters. So let me explain why that scene is important in establishing who this character is. Um, because otherwise, if people aren't quite paying attention or they're just playing this casually, he might appear as just, you know, just some creep or just some asshole who doesn't allow you to save that guy. But he's being very realistic and logical in that situation. And he's uh, kind of educating you on how to take advantage of that. It's like you don't always need to be the hero. It's like sometimes in order to do a greater good, you need to just let things be how they're going to be and take advantage of that what I find interesting is how he comes to take a well an interest in Arno because he says because of where they were in the Bastille but um, he doesn't really go into depth there it's like um, and if I'm recalling correctly because I don't have the footage I believe he was like one of the characters you can intera interact with in the prison in your cell um, other than Belik 
this would suggest that he was observing Arno and Bellic in their um, their sparring and the duels, and he saw, I believe, like talent there, obviously. And uh, I am kind of curious as to why he never approached Bellic, but that could be because of just how headstrong of a character Bellic is. Whereas Arno is new, he's impressionable, he can be taken advantage of, uh, as we observed earlier and how he had taught Arno. Either way, this man is an astute observer and uh, an incredible manipulator because of what he is able to achieve to, well, get his end goal, which is to be the new king of beggars. He wants that power and he obtains it without hardly having to work for it. I really enjoyed these sequences and I'm glad that they made this addition into the series and I hope it continues, we'll see. But just how your character observes the environment that he's supposed to infiltrate, and then he discovers these uh, weaknesses and these weak points, uh, how he may exploit it, how he may take advantage of it as an assassin, and that's pretty incredible. What a wasted opportunity with these two characters that assassinate uh, De La Serre. Brother. It just feels like they could have been fleshed out so much more, but I suppose in the, the grand interest of the story, they weren't, weren't really that integral to the plot. It is done. De La Serre is dead. Grandmaster. Good. The Grandmaster is also a massive disappointment. Um, I'll get into that later, though. Monsieur Germain, the silversmith. I have massive problems with the way they handled the silversmith, but there are some Please. interesting tidbits that occurred during this mission. First, I need to know about... Let's go. No! They'll be watching the front entrance. We'll have to go downstairs and across. Follow me then. Like, oh, look Stay at me. Quiet. I'm so helpful. Trust me. Believe me. I believe there's a psychological trick foolish. that they Let do the here, the writer, as well as the character of the silversmith, because... He's in this uh, predicament where he's vulnerable, and you're there to save him, and he saves himself. Uh, and it's really interesting where he had stabbed that Templar in the throat so that he wouldn't be able to speak, because, you know, like, oh, you stabbed me. Well, I'm going to reveal who you actually are. So, uh, I'm conflicted when it comes to this character. I don't know. Kind of reminds me of the side. Overheard. Using you to take advantage of a situation. He did ask permission this I think this exchange uh, is pretty interesting. Uh, it kind of shows where there's a conflict but between this old school no and new school action. way of doing things, but yes. also kind of uh, reveals aspects of Arno's character where he is obsessed with his more private vendetta than he is with the actual order. But the order is in conflict with itself because it seems to be coming to this, this turning point in the world and in yet. time, so but it's refusing to turn. So naturally, Get what happens stairs. is, Quickly. well, as you will observe later on in the plot, what happens to the Grand Master? Dead. I suppose I'd never really realized while playing the game that there seems to be this like inner struggle upon both sides within the Assassin's Creed, uh, sorry, within the Brotherhood and within the Templar Order. Um, so I guess right now what has just happened is Arnold kind of spurned this civil, 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 oh my god, civil war. Um, and well, this is the, this is the consequences of those actions. So, seems you've been busy. Tracking down the man who killed your father, yes. Best of luck. He's killed most of my allies. So there's actually a few things I want to say about silence. that. Um, no one, it's uh, the focus that he has on uh, finding the killer of her father, whereas with his own father, he doesn't really seem to sure mention it or bat an eye. And, uh, you know, obviously who the killer was, which is Shade Cormac and Assassin's Creed Rogue, and I, I just don't understand how that's never addressed, so that seems like an incredibly large missed opportunity. Uh, but I do buy that uh, these two clearly love each other and care for each other, and it's almost this uh, Romeo and Juliet-esque type of uh, romance, I suppose, as it would be. Do you trust me? 
I mean, you can tell just by the hood reveal. He's like, look, I'm still the boy you grew up with. I'm not Arno the assassin. I'm Arno, your friend. The same one who helped you over the wall into that dog-infested orchard. All right. Mirabeau. Must we rehash this debate again? We must, and we will, Master Kimmer. If you cannot see the advantage in being owed a favor by Francois de Lasser's daughter, I despair for our future. I and mean, Mirabeau is obviously a forward Continue. thinker, and it's a shame. Lasser. What uh, happens to this character, because you can see this is a guy that's really trying his best and is thinking generations ahead of everybody else and not letting petty and differences and vengeance seethe his mind. <laughs> it just makes me laugh because I, I guess that slipped past him, or I'm not sure, but that AI was triggered to greet Arno and it's like this super situ super serious situation and <laughs> it's just a funny little blip. Elise. What is this? I found him like this. I didn't. Of course not. But I have to report I really this hate Council this story beat because it just feels no. so rushed and it doesn't me, feel earned at all, especially with who the killer actually right. is. So of course, you're I, right. I just feel like this was completely mishandled. You're with the other one, aren't you? The hooded man. Tell me about this other one. <sighs> Could he, he be talking about know. a member of the Brotherhood? Ah. An assassin? Maybe? For a hood like mine. Well, there are shades of grey in every good story. I mean, that's a bit on the nose. It's like them apologizing to the player, like saying, Yeah, not all of the Brotherhood is good. And, you know, they literally just hinted at what a hooded, hooded figure is. And, you know, now you got Arnold going, He looked like me. I don't know. It's stupid. Don't treat your audience like they're stupid. Otherwise, they're going to act stupid. I'm hoping I can pick up a trick myself. Please. This seems so foolish on so many levels, especially given how events unfold at the end of the game. Uh, it just seems so hypocritical, and again, it's an annoying story beat. The best part, Balak, should have known it'd be you that find me. Only question is, what happens now? You poisoned Mirabeau. He poisoned us. Peace with the Templars is a fairy tale. And you're the only one who can save the Brotherhood? You think it's the first time this has happened? The first time that the Assassins have been forced to purge their leadership? The first time that the Order has built itself back up from nothing to power? No. Masyaf, Monteregioni, the American colonies. It's all happened before, and we have risen anew, stronger than ever. But now, we've lost our purpose, Arno. We mired ourselves in politics and revolutions, but we're not a nation. We're an army. And in an army, making peace with the enemy is called treason. No. I'm not the only one that can save the Brotherhood. We can. Together. Balak. You know I can't do that. That's a pity. Please. So, that was a great performance by the actors, um, especially on Bellix, and uh, again, I don't really feel like it's earned. It's... I don't feel enough of a connection with Bellic to like really feel betrayed here. Um, I also don't think that his reasons are that great. I mean, it just sounds like hatred with the, um, that's veiled by... I don't know, political, I mean, even though he says he's against the politics, but it just seems so 
politically driven and <laughs> it just kind of falls apart on its own foundation. I think this was a well fought battle and uh, I think the interaction between the two characters was great. Um, I don't know if I completely believe his uh, ending monologue here, his threats, but um, I think it kind of goes to show that this is a character who came to a turning point and he refused to turn. So it is because of that choice that he had made. This is the consequence for that choice. And, I mean, clearly he prefers it this way. He'd rather die than evolve into the world that is evolving before him. That it's not as simple as Templars are bad, assassins are good. It's just not the reality anymore. Thank you, my friend. Gotta get you back to that boy here in one piece. No way, piss pot. Drop this. So my audio for this is messed up. I accidentally forgot to turn off the microphone on my controller. But I do want people to observe this scene because, like I said, this character is always interesting to observe. And I'm going to try to mute it on my side and just point out interesting things about the scene. So that question is designed to, uh, he doesn't care about the actual answer. What he cares about is the reaction to the question, especially to um, Elise. He wants to see what type of person this character is that has Arno's attention. And obviously, she is not having it. See, and that's really interesting that she takes a step back but doesn't reach for the weapon and he takes a step forward so it's like he's in complete control although his attention keeps getting diverted I believe that's him realizing she's more trouble than she's worth and far more difficult to manipulate this next sequence I didn't enjoy at all uh, I guess what we're seeing here is Arno uh, reacting to being rejected by Elise for not being cutthroat enough and by the Brotherhood for being too much of a untamed animal uh, and not sharing their ideals. But uh, enjoy my genuine reaction to <laughs> what's going on. Where am I? Am I drunk? Oh my god. Oh god, his beard looks like shit. You wait just here. I will return when this hand reaches the top. They really squander this opportunity to kind of dive into Arno, Arno's feelings about his no father explore. and that mm -hmm. day. Yes, and uh, for them to only now reference this, whereas before it's only slightly being referenced every time he looks at its pocket watch, it just feels manipulative and again I'm going to use unearned it's just mishandled and really disappointing Oh, no. He 
You look like hell. This entire sequence just like feels like a waste of time. Like I think it would have been far more That's powerful for the watch to have stood missing or gone um, as a result of his actions. It's like, talk to me like that. it doesn't make to sense to me this? that whenever he's careless, things just happen to work out for him. I'm sorry that I care more about you and than about I don't know. It just robs the emotional impact of that moment. It, as well as him even seeing the memories of his adoptive father, at least his father. I can't bear the fact that my carelessness got your father killed. Everything I've done since then has been to fix that mistake and to prevent it from happening again. Bullshit. You must have come here with something in mind. What was it? Paris is tearing itself apart. Jamal has driven the revolution to new heights of depravity. The guillotines operate nearly around the clock now. And what do you expect me to do about it? Uh, what does Arno care about? Is he a good guy? What, what does he genuinely care about? He's like, what do I do about it? Get the fuck out of here. You're better than this. And that's manipulative. Look, these people are incredibly toxic. And I'm going it's back to ridiculous. Paris. Are you coming? Merci. Go find yourself a doctor. You know, I wanted to include that because I think that's interesting on the uh, on Arno's character. Uh, we'll see what we can maybe able to uh, ascertain from that. In this scene, not only we as the player, but also Arno, the character, has to come to grips with just what type of person Elise is and I think he finds it rather shocking what she's capable of and may even be a little bit disturbed by it. Then right. Look at that, he's like, I can't even look at you right now. I don't recognize you. The temple, I should have known. I hope you enjoy revolutionary justice, monsieur. At least now you're betting in an eye, pretty much saying, you deserve this, you did this, not me. I'm not sure that's... Less chance we both get caught that way. Look at that, solely focused, cold. Him relenting. If you get a shot at Jarman, Just pinpoint focus on that, she does not care about anything else that is all she's thinking about right now and that look pretty much said don't mess this up not again I can't help but think that Arno is telling himself like we finish this and everything's back to normal Elise is back to normal we're back to normal we'll figure this out I think he's having this internal struggle with who she is this is where we see just who these people are. What does Arno care about? What does Elise care about? And the choices that are made here reveals that entirely. I'm stuck! He's getting away! Wait! I'm almost free! I can take him! No, you can't! Not alone! Wait for me! Stating the truth. Her being blinded by rage. I'm sorry. Hey. I'm sorry, this is who I am. <laughs> and this is who Arno is. His identity. He is the protector. He wants to protect somebody from dying the same way everybody else has. I don't think they could have done anything more powerful than this, and this is a real consequence due to the decisions that the characters have made. I, I don't think they could have done anything more powerful than that. And that adds a sense of realism to that. Oh. 
But now the question is asked to the player, what would you do? What kind of person are you? Given the choice, given the control of Arno, you are now Arno. And you, I don't even know if you have the option to run. I didn't even attempt it. I just you killed her. You die now. And it's slow death. It's at this point, though, that one would realize that Arno's greatest fear has just happened. So, as this is integral to the identity of his character as the protector, what is he to do now? Does he rise above, find new purpose, or does he stay in the ground, miserable, reliving this memory over and over and over again? This is the incredible thing about video games is now if you could pose that question towards yourself, whatever that great fear may be, what would you do? Would you rise above or lie there writhing in pain? The creed of the Assassin Brotherhood teaches us that nothing is forbidden to us. Once I thought that meant we were free to do as we would. To pursue our ideals, no matter the cost. I understand now. Not a grant of permission, the creed is a warning. Ideals too easily give way to dogma. Dogma becomes fanaticism. No higher power sits in judgment of us. No supreme being watches to punish us for our sins. In the end, only we ourselves can guard against our obsessions. Only we can decide whether the road we walk carries too high a toll. We believe ourselves redeemers, avengers, saviors, we make war on those who oppose us, and they in turn make war on us. We dream of leaving our stamp upon the world. Even as we give our lives in a conflict that will be recorded in no history book. All that we do, all that we are, begins and ends with ourselves. If you had difficulty understanding that, I understand, but I really encourage you to rewatch that or even look up the words of those that you don't understand because there's a powerful message there that everybody should live by. A strange ending for uh, the villain of this story, but we will continue this with the DLC immediately after these credits. until your bill is paid. You can. He's with me. I thought you were guillotined. 
What a dreadful thing to say to your rescuer. Did you receive my message? If I do this, I want to leave France. I can procure you passage from Marseille on a ship to Egypt in four days. You have a clue as to the location of the manuscript. Condorcet knew he was being hunted. He disappeared for two days before his arrest. He left this behind. His manuscript must be in Louis IX's tomb. The royal crypt! Oh, I must warn you, monsieur. The ghosts of the kings wander the caverns. When they corner their hapless victim, they place upon his brow a crown made of knives, penetrating the eyes, which leak like grapes crushed in the harvest. Still, far less frightening than being crowned the next king of France. <laughs> Speaking of grapes, do your job. Yes, monsieur. Find the tomb marked with this crest and recover the last manuscript. I'll meet you in three days' time. To your health, Arno. As we can observe, Arno is obviously in a dark place. Um, <laughs> not quite matching up with the ending of the... Uh, main story but i think this is more true to his character anyhow um as we picked up from the scene it does seem that uh he's drinking his sorrows away and he's in uh, business with our old friend so just to touch on uh, what this dlc includes uh, gameplay wise is I'm not, i can't remember if i included the guillotine but the guillotine is a heavy weapon that includes a mortar that you can shoot and take down groups of enemies as you'll probably observe in my gameplay and uh, there's also this one-handed weapon that you have to work towards by doing the side missions that will actually blind the enemies so it's a nice little uh, cheat i guess so to speak but well earned of course, big shocker, I have uh, several problems with this DLC. It's mainly that it seems to be consisting of fetch, like go here in order to progress the story, go there in order to progress the story, go underground, and it really just seems like a lot of padding. But there are elements of this story that I enjoy and I want to uh, inform you on. We have to stop him and save the people of France. Rescuing them only delays the inevitable. What's wrong with you? You're going to get yourself killed for nothing, little man. Do you see that? Do it. Delays the Not inevitable. Ten. He is now repeating the lesson that was given to him by Germain. Uh, it just really shows you that he's been traumatized. Like, he fears for the life of this little boy. And he's telling him, like, you are going to get killed. And who else was just recently killed that he loves? Elise. Give me the manuscript. Why? It has nothing to do with anything, does it? I'm leaving the country. That's my way out. Trying to run away from all of his issues, all of his problems, all of his trauma. France, where we all take care of each other. Why don't you grow up? Forget He's France. now coming into conflict with his identity. It's like, he doesn't have anybody to care about right now. So he's like, why do I care? He doesn't have that protector what role anymore. To turn you into such a and the kid picks up on that. You can't save them. And never he remembers. Back. That's why he gave that face. I think a major component of Arno's anger is towards himself. Like, yes, he's yelling at the kid, but he's really yelling at himself. He's like, you don't care about France. You don't care about anybody. Just get out. We're closed. Someone is looking for you. Who? The Marquis. Elise! Yeah, this is the way undealt trauma works, you know? You're, that person is always on your mind, always at the corner of the room, always the distant person in the crowd, and now he's chasing this person. Like, he saw her die. Like, he logically, he understands. Yeah, look at him. And here comes the revelation. This is not who he thought she was. He knows something's wrong. He's in pain. 
Thank you for returning, Leon. Good luck with him. I once had a son. I'm sorry. No. He's alive. I left him. I began the orphanage afterward. Now that's love. Sometimes. And all that Obviously, anger that he's just bottling about. up is like turns into this, this righteous fury for orphanage. him, so he could just this release it. Calling. It's small, but and it's there. Could have been the savior of lots. Children. Madame Margot. He's behind the orphanage. That was manipulation, but she gets a pass because she knew that. He would do the right thing, and when coming face to face with it, he made the right decision. Replace little man with piss pot, and so I swear what? he's adopted a little bit of the demeanor of Belek. Obviously, we'll without the, the extreme, but he then seems I'm to be gone. falling back on Fine, the familiarity. But how? Bonjour. What have you been doing? Nothing. Did you find the lock? Yes. Now I need the key. You know As the you can see, uh, they're developing more of a friendship, if not partnership. I, Even the hostility it. that was just emanating from Arno just seems to have dissipated. Here, His complete demeanor has changed. He's friendly. So this sequence is incredible. I loved it. It's just it was so different. Such a nice change of pace. And uh, it really was a slow burn to get to this point, but it is worth this little thing. Um, other than like the minor Dark story that's involved, that uh, it really does remind me of uh, if you play as uh, Altair during Assassin's Creed Revelations and the power that the Apple of Eden or whatever it was just did to the enemy. It's just nice nostalgia. Deserting your post. The destruction of inequality between different nations. The progress of equality in one and the same nation. Final passengers! This must reach Al Mualim in Cairo. Ha! And lastly, the real improvement of man. I think that's a good message to end it on. It's strange that it was delivered by Morky this odd, but <laughs> still, I think the message is a great one to end on. Alright everybody, that was quite the ride, and I really enjoyed figuring out this review. I think towards that last uh, half hour mark, I really kind of figured out what I want to do with this channel. So, uh, if you're on this journey with me from beginning to end, I thank you so very much, and... If you wouldn't mind, please give me a uh, like and a subscribe onto my uh, YouTube for more content like this. It encourages me. It helps. Um, obviously, we're only going to improve from here on out. And uh, please let me know in the comments any uh, thoughts you had on the uh, review, the game, uh, any feedback at all. Criticism, of course, is always welcome. Please be respectful and kind. Um, thank you, guys. You have a good one.